ophthalmologists. We are happy to hold this uh, uh, series of webinars, which uh, is highly appreciated by our viewers. Uh, anyway, uh, President Dr. Chandramapal regrets for not being able to join us this evening as she is fulfilling her duty in a national webinar at this time. So on behalf of the president and team Kolkata Association of Ophthalmology, I extend a hearty welcome to each one of you over to the container of the session. Thank you, Dr. Shiroji. It is indeed an honor to be here today, this evening studied with stars in the ophthalmology world. So not wasting much time, I would like to start the session with introduction of our chairman, sir, of the evening. Can I have the slides? Shogatu. Dr. P.K. Bukshi, sir, is very well known, not only in India, but abroad. After his FRCS, he's been a pioneer in ECC, IOL, and PICO emulsification in Eastern India, mentor and teacher to a generation of ophthalmologists, founder chairman of BBI Foundation in Kolkata, Sir is the fountainhead of super speciality services for the last 32 years. Welcome, sir. Along with this, I also introduce, please go on to the next slide, our keynote address, Dr. SPS Graywall, sir. He is a CEO in Graywall Eye Institute and a professor in Fenberg School of Medicine, Department of Ophthalmology. Northwestern University, Chicago, USA. After his MBBS and MD from Patiala, Punjab University, he has been having a numerous publications, lots of experience in ophthalmology for 41 years of service, 12 years in PGI, until he himself formed a new setup. And he's got 150 national international publications Please go on to the next slides. He is an avid photographer and a software developer. These, he has numerous achievements, as I said. Some of them are the first diode retinal laser in the country in 1993, Colonel Rangamachari Gold Medal Award in 1989 in the iOS, International Scholar Award in AAO 2014. He introduced C3R treatment for keratoconus first time in the Indian subcontinent, 2006. His center, uh, has been uh, awarded the Healthcare Excellence Award for Eye Specialist in Chandigarh uh, for his outstanding achievements and is right now NABH accredited in 2014. It uh, ins has been uh, installed with the first robo laser in country in 2014. Welcome, sir, and we look forward to an uh, enriching session for us. Please go on to uh, introduce the Next slide, please. With him will be our very own Dr. Arubhovic, sir. When light is a lot, then you don't have to enlighten him. So Dr. Arubhovic himself is a, a prolific anterior segment surgeon from this part of India, is a senior consultant at Dishai Hospitals, handling the most challenging cases with presentations in national and international podium. He has been an inspiration in academic and research for younger surgeons. Welcome Dr. Arubhumik, sir. Please go on. In the panels, we have Dr. Parthu Biswas, sir. Sir is a director of BBI Foundation and chairman scientific committee, AIOS. He has been chairman ARC of AIOS from 2014 to 2019. I think it would be a whole webinar where we would have to go on with Sir's achievements and awards, both in India and as well as abroad, and numerous publications, teacher, reviewer in write-ups and journals. The famous court martial session in AIOS is being conducted by him. 75 sessions have been done. He is in postgraduate. Teach, teaching and as an evaluator of AIOS in academics, he's a guide for DNB, a guest faculty in national and international conference. Welcome Dr. Parthu Biswas, sir. And next we have Dr. Shugato Pal, 
who is a comprehensive ophthalmologist practicing at Amunajuti Eye Foundation, Amri Hospitals in Sumitra Eye Care. He's an anterior segment surgeon, special interest in medical retina. He has served in UK in multiple places as director of diabetic retinopathy screening and management services. He's a recipient of Srimati Shobha Bhuti Dash Ghost Award in OSWB and Murali Dhar Sengupta Memorial Award of Kao 2018. Currently, the Chairman Scientific Committee of OSWB. Welcome, Dr. Shugatopal, sir. And with him is none other than Dr. Please go on. Dr. Arup Bose, sir, uh, MBBS from Medical College. After his post-graduation in Aligarh, he's done his DNB and FRCS in 1997. Present position, he's a medical director of Bose EMLC in Chinsura, Hubli, West Bengal. A numerous awards and achievements, and among the, the few to be mentioned amongst them is Dr. B.K. Mitra Award 2006 for best paper. He has received certificate of honor from Barnett Dulne, I Foundation USA in 1999. He has received the Certificate of Honor for Excellence in Fakic IOLs in Germany, conducted various studies in dry eye, ocular allergy, etc., presented papers, moderated, judged in national, regional, and state level conferences, performed life surgeries, and is a proficient surgeon, a prolific surgeon, doing all types of IOLs and performing multifocal IOLs since 2005. Welcome, sir. Next. And to moderate the session is none other than our Dr. Ajay Pal, sir, who has been a teacher to many of us here as a graduate, postgraduate from Silchar Medical College. We are trained from Arvind Eye Hospital, Madurai, and a visiting fellow in Moorfield Eye Hospital. Uh, presented papers, videos, awards, um, numerous awards, especially to mention the series of awards three in uh, challenging cases in ESCRS, best video awards in DOS, OSWB, IRSI gold medal in 2009 and 2016. Sir is right now the director of BBI Foundation with his practice of last 25 years in Kolkata. And along with him to moderate the session is Dr. Shiddhartu Ghosh, sir, please go on to the next slide who is a consultant ophthalmologist, again, a very proficient surgeon of anterior segment and also posterior segment, GD Hospital and Diabetes Institute, Kolkata, and also in Apollo Medical Center, Kolkata, as well as Nightingale Hospital, Kolkata. So welcome Dr. Shiddhartha Gosar. And uh, with this, I hand over to the moderators of the session to start the session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shidipta. I think, uh, well, she is the convener of this session. Well, she is the director of RMI Hospital in Tultura and along, and she has been a FECO refractive, a prolific FECO refractive surgeon, a postgraduate from Arvind from uh, Ahmedabad. And she is a senior consultant at AMRI. Silverline Hospital, Shraddha, and also a FECO refractive surgeon at BBI Foundation, a fellow of Shankar Nepal, and LASIK trained from New Vision Center with 17 years plus practice. And I welcome, yes, our keynote addressee, please unshare. It will be my privilege and honor to invite Dr. Grewal to give his keynote address. As you have heard, he is a prolific cataract refractive surgeon and many of us to his credit. Welcome, sir. The stage is all yours. Very well, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. And my sincere thanks to Kolkata Association of Ophthalmology to have me uh, today evening as a speaker. And uh, thanks to Dr. Chakraborty, Dr. Sudiptu, and Dr. Ajay uh, for the introduction and giving me this time. So I'll be sharing some of my experiences uh, with trifocals. Um, how how the journey has been and how I, I am handling the cases. As you know, cataract surgery is now a refractive surgery. And some of the reasons are that biometry has improved a lot. The optical biometries and spectral domain biometries are available. We have a better understanding of both the anterior and posterior corneal curvature now. 
we have a better understanding of the effective lens positions, the refined lens constants, and we have a better formula available, uh, some of them with the use of the AI, which will give us more accurate calculations for the power of the IOL. And why trifocals? Because they give a greater depth of field, improving the intermediate range of vision. There are less dysphotopsias as compared to the conventional multifocal IOL, and the patient realizes the greater need and advantage of the intermediate vision, especially with the, the use of the screens increasing. I would not be going into the details of the physics or the optics of the design of the trifocals. I'll be limiting myself only to the, the surgical clinical aspects of these cases. The first and foremost, patient selection. So make sure there is no contraindication as, a, in, as in cases of inflammation or uveitis. It's important to have a patient where you are going to do a bilateral implantation. That means the patient should be ready for an early surgery for the other eye. Uh, even if the other eye is 6-6, six, six, I'll still counsel the patient that in case you are going in for trifocal in the first eye and you have some issues in adjustment to the vision, be prepared for an early surgery in the other eye. Otherwise, you land into a situation where patients say that unless my vision is very good, I'll not get the surgery done in the other eye. And, and the, the consultant statement remains that till you get the surgery in the other eye, you are not likely to improve. Make sure that the post-operative astigmatism is controlled and you expect it to be about 0.5 or less than that. Post-operative emetropia is very important with trifocal lenses and maximum of 0.25 hyperopia is what is recommended. Is patient motivation, motivation important? Uh, I'll say yes. If the patient, if, if I talk about the trifocal to a patient and his first reaction is I don't want, then I don't want to force trifocal to a patient who is reluctant to have it or who has shared or where any patient with, uh, uh, with not perfect results with trifocal has talked to that patient or shared that patient. So don't force trifocals to a patient who is reluctant to have it. Uh, the macular pathologies and ocular other ocular morbidities do remain as uh, exclusion criteria. Uh, when, I, when you're doing a surgery in the second eye and the first eye has been done elsewhere, please dilate the pupil and make your clinical evaluation of what type of implant has been used in the other eye. If the other eye has a monofocal, avoid using the trifocal. Control the astigmatism. Unrealistic visual expectations should not be there. If a patient who is happy with reading glasses, again, it, it, you have to see whether to go in for trifocal for these or not. Mm -hmm. And if there are surgical, surgical uh, um, complications, then you should be ready to handle them. In the preoperative factors, uh, as I've already mentioned, that explain all possible outcomes, the way you expect the results in this particular cases, uh, as it is said that undersell and over deliver, look for dry eye symptoms. Uh, they will worsen post-surgery. So be ready to treat and inform the patient in the preoperative period. Now, coming down to the subsets, I, I, I think the biometry is the foundation for successful surgery with trifocal implants. So we are using the, the IL master and we have also the LENSTAR and we do biometry uh, on both the machines and we do the Pentacam also in all the cases and we look for uh, the aberrations on the Osiris T also. This is the biometry being done on IL Master 700. And once the biometry is done, you can, can do the calculations on the screen. And you have the Barrett suite with the uh, total TK or total keratometry value where anterior and posterior are taken into consideration. And you get a printout over which all the different parameters are there. And uh, we have a printout of the, the Barrett Universal, both TK and uh, the anterior K. And then based on this, uh, we'll be, I'll be selecting the lens. The, I have found that the match of the, the AT LISA try with the biometry of uh, the 700, I'll master 700, is fairly accurate. 
Now, if we so astigmatism, it is important to handle the astigmatism. And uh, if the question is that, how will I handle the astigmatism or up to what level I'll ignore the astigmatism? So I'll say that my tolerance is 0%. So if it is about 0.9 or one diopter of cylinder, I'll be going in for the toric implant. If it is less than that, then we'll do the LRI calculations. And depending upon the calculations and depending on the axis and the incision where you are placing, uh, if the calculation suggests that LRI is required, then I'll be doing LRI in these cases with trifocals. Now, there are situations where you may find that you have done biometry on different uh, machines. Like if, if my Pentacam, I'll master 700 and lens master readings do not correlate with each other. And, and believe me, it's not uncommon. I don't know the reason why it happens. Probably the way they handle the cornea, probably there are variations in different uh, parts of the cornea as you go away from the center. In case there is a difference in, in reading from these machines, I will not do a trifocal in this case uh, because I don't know which of these is giving an accurate reading and I don't want to land into uh, ametropia after a successful surgery. Now, this is... Uh, the this is the now we'll go through uh, surgery two cases of surgery i do flex for all the cases uh, for two reasons one reason is the capsule otme that it gives me a perfect centered capsule otme in every case that helps in the alignment of the lens. And second is the ability to correct low astigmatism also. Uh, I'll do a gentle hydro dissection, just a gentle cleavage between the capsule and the outer cortex. And since the nucleus is already divided and nucleotomy is done, so removing the pieces is, is quite easy. And then I do the IA. And after doing the IA, and this is the loading of the lens. The laser try comes pre-loaded, and uh, you have to just insert this into the injector, which again is quite easy. And uh, I do it myself under the microscope. So this is the injector, and. Uh, the plunger system. This is how you fit the cartridge into it, right? Then remove the lock that is there on it. This you throw away. Then you put a viscoelastic into the cartridge over the implant, which is already in position. Close the cartridge. the lens and make sure under the microscope that the lens is engaged properly and then insert the lens. Insertion of the lens is, is quite easy and it goes smoothly. It's a plate haptic implant. And after the flex you get a very good centration of the lens in relation to the capsule otme. This is now, um, we'll go through the second surgery. This is another case. And uh, the same steps, I put viscoelastic, then I do the side ports. I prefer to do two side ports and then I'll inject viscoelastic to reform the anterior chamber and then the main incision. This is the main incision and then remove the anterior capsule. You will have a free floating capsule lot may in most of the cases, still you have to take caution when you're removing it. 
Uh, this is the, I, I go into the anterior capsule, tent it up, inject fluid and do a hydro dissection, which will separate the cortex from the capsule and then go it with the FACO probe. So the fragments are practically already divided. So all you need to do is very little force to separate them. And then you can just suck it with minimum use of FACO power. So now the, the lens matter is removed, little bit of cortex is left. You remove that. And if there are a few fibers onto the posterior capsule, I like to do the hydro polishing, just a stream of fluid. It, make, it just polishes the posterior capsule and gives you excellent central clear area. Uh, reform it with sodium hyaluronate. Take the lens, load it, and then inject it. Now, this is a toric implantation. Uh, this is the callister, and then you place the lens exactly along the axis as marked by this um, callister. And this is how the lens is, ex is exactly in position at the end of the surgery. Now it's important that when you're using trifocals and the lens and the surgery needs perfection, you need to have the best tools available. Uh, this is the RTO 800 and it has really made the surgery a lot comfortable because you can see the things under very high resolution. You had seen the videos which have been uh, recorded on the RTO. This is the view of the operation theater. This is the surgery in progress. This is another view of the RTO 800 being used. Now we have a questionnaire that is in the EMR and we fill these for the cases. And when we analyzed our cases, we found that the general satisfaction was about 4.17 out of a scale of best of five, which is excellent for distant vision. The general satisfaction for the near vision was also close to that at 4.11. The satisfaction of the intermediate vision again was good, 4.29. That means the patients were, were very satisfied with their distant vision, intermediate vision, as well as their near vision. The adaptation between photopic and mesopic conditions was good with a scale of satisfaction of 3.64. And stereopsis, or ability to find correct distance, again, very good. And the night driving had the lowest score, that is 2.82. And the vision during the day was at 3.76. The difficulties associated to HALO, I'll say it was the average. That means the patient did experience those. And over-satisfaction was good. When we look at the defocus curve, what the, because the defocus curve is the best objective indicator of the expected range of vision for a patient using any press biopia correcting lens. And it can help us to set realistic expectations for our patients. Uh, along with the questionnaire, the software has, uh, the EMR has the module to enter the data for calculating the defocus curve. This is the defocus curve for AT Lisa. It's giving you a very good range for about three diopters, a uh, distant vision, and then uh, you have the intermediate vision, and then you have a very flat curve up to 2.5 diopters, 2.75 diopters. And these cases have excellent uh, near vision. Now, if we look this plot, compare it with the technus multifocal, you will find that the near vision with, with AT-LISA is better than the technus multifocal and the intermediate vision here is again definitely better than what you have with the technus multifocal. So you gain in intermediate vision and you also gain in the near vision with AT-LISA try. If you look at the technus symphony, 
it does have a definitely better intermediate vision than the other two implants. But the default curve shows that after two diopters or 1.75 diopters, there is a dip. That means that symphony will give a good intermediate vision, but as we have experienced that the near vision is not that good. And most of the cases will need glasses for, for the near work. And when we look at AT Lara, again, it is a EDOF, but the near vision is again an issue, not that good. And this is what is the monofocal lens. Monofocal lens, you just get the distant vision and you can see that even after half diopter, the slope starts going down. And a little better with the eye hands lens, these are lenses which are giving a little bit of intermediate vision, but the greater range and the flattest curve is coming with the, the AT Lisa. The overall satisfaction, when we compared with these lenses, we found that the overall satisfaction was the best with the trifocal lens. Now, all surgeons have wishes, and I also have a wish, and that is that the, I wish the surgery was a bed of roses, uh, which it is not so. Uh, you always land up with some of the issue, uh, some of the other uh, bumpers on the way. And one of the important one is the dry eyes, which is a game spoiler. Uh, this is a case 62 years old who had a visual equity of 69, operated for cataract. The fundus was normal, OCT was normal, anterior segment was normal. There was nothing unusual in the post-op period. Patient had uh, 69 vision, auto ref showing 00, zero. fluctuating vision at two weeks, patient not happy is complaining of glare, fluctuating vision, and not comfortable with vision. And the, he had a OSTI score, uh, which was higher, and he had um, uh, dry eyes, tear film breaking at about four to five seconds. And when we did the mybography, we found that he had a mybovian gland disease with most of the mybovian glands not working. Uh, we did the lipi flow for him, and uh, in the post-op period, he was fine. Uh, this is because you see that the, the maximum refraction takes place at the front of the eye. And if the tear film is not good, it's finally going to affect the quality of the vision. So within four weeks, patient was fine and he wanted surgery in the other eye. So dry eyes, it's best to diagnose it preoperatively, manage it with depending upon what the severity and the reason is that the patient, you need punctal plugs, you need to do lipi flow, you need to increase the medications. And only then, because that will also help in a more accurate biometry, that is the when you should take the patient. If somehow you have missed it in the preoperative period, have a high suspicion in the post-op period because these patients, otherwise you, on slit lamp examination, you may find them normal. Another of the, another of the speed breaker is the posterior capsule opacification. And one should have a low threshold for yak capsulotomy in patients with visually significant central posterior capsule opacification. And I'll suggest that as soon as patient notices a deterioration in vision after the trifocal, go ahead and do a yak capsulotomy and do not wait to see a thick and white capsule on a slit lamp examination. In the post-operative period, the single most important thing uh, that I, I, I have realized is listen carefully to the patient. When listening to an unhappy trifocal IOL patient, you want to get to the bottom of their satisfaction. Reassure the patient that you care about his or her problem and are determined to find a solution. Important to reassure the patient that his or her experience is not uncommon and that you expect it to work towards a solution. And, and you might need to distinguish between what might be an initial issue with neuroadaptation versus a problem that will require an intervention. If you find that there is a little issue with, this, with the surgical outcome, which needs an intervention, please don't wait for the neuroadaptation. Then do be, be, give, give the patient a early solution. Assuming ametropia, Patients in early post-operative period with complaints relating to near vision or halos likely fall in the category with neuroadaptation issues. Patients with complaints with distant vision 
uh, assuming emetropia are more likely to require an IL exchange. Studies show that the main cause of dissatisfaction is blurry vision, and the most common causes are a residual refractive error. And that is why I emphasize that a good biometry is, is the foundation of a successful trifocal surgery. Dry eye syndrome, it is much more prevalent and causes much more problems than we actually realize in day-to-day -day practice. PCO, I have mentioned it should be a little toler less tolerance for posterior capsule pacification and early recapsulotomy is recommended. IL decentration remains an issue. Look for any cystoid macular edema. And as the residual refractive errors affect everything near intermediate distance as well as the night vision, explain the possibility preoperatively to the patient. Don't hesitate to offer solutions such as glasses or contact lens because doing a refraction and giving the glasses with trifocal where vision is not 6'9", at least builds up the confidence of the patient that he has the normal vision and there will be some solution taking care of him. Then surgical solutions such as refractive surgery or IOL exchange can be considered and you need to be sensitive to it, expressing the compassion to the patient. So if there is blurred vision and there is ametropia, then you will be going in for spectacles or refractive surgery. Otherwise, if it is an issue with the IOL, either IOL repositioning or IOL exchange, or if it is a PCO, you will do a IAC capsulotomy. The, this is an interesting study by ha Hayashi that um, Slight myopia significantly improved near visual acuity, but worsened distant visual acuity. Whereas slight hyperopia worsened both distant and near visual acuity in eyes with trifocal IL, suggesting that slight myopia is better target refraction than slight hyperopia. Now, this is contrary to what we have a belief that we should leave the patient a, a little hyperopic after the surgery. And I would say that the approach should be to hit emetropia as accurately as you can. Uh, this is the case with the cystoid macular edema and uh, preoperative, if you're doing trifocal preoperative OCT is mm -hmm. mandatory. And if in the postoperative period, vision is not good. And even if the pre-op OCT was normal, I'll recommend that you should do a OCT in the postoperative period and make sure that the macula is healthy. The common photopic phenomena experienced by these cases are glare, halos, dysphotopsia, which are about 3.5 times more likely with multifocal IOL than monofocal IOLs, can be due to uh, early small islands of PCO, can be related to the pupil size. If it is a pupil size issue, you can try uh, pharmacological agents. If there is an IOL issue, then it goes to IL repositioning, IL exchange. If nothing, then would you like to wait for neuro adaptation? I would suggest that you should have a cutoff value that I'll wait for say six weeks, eight weeks, two months, three months, but then give a solution to the patient because these eyes otherwise have a potential of getting normal vision. Uh, is there any role of angle kappa? Yes, it has a role. Um, in the eye with a small angle kappa, the rays of light would be able to pass through the IOL center without disturbance. But in an eye with a large angle kappa, a fovea-centric ray may hit the edge of the ring, thus giving rise to edge glare. And this is an interesting study by, study by Young by Yung, Yung, where they have shown that the spectacle independence is not affected by angle kappa. It remains the same irrespective of the extent of the angle kappa, but the glare and halo are more if the angle kappa is more. So it's a good idea to keep it in mind. Now, handling the complications. Now, one thing which, again, uh, I dread is the PC tear. Now, what should be done? It's a very difficult situation. It also depends whether it is the first eye or it is the second eye. Uh, can you change to monofocal? If it is the first eye, you can change to monofocal. Is there availability of three-piece trifocal or multifocal which where you would like to postpone the surgery, arrange for the new lens and then go in for it or shift to monofocal? Because decenter trifocals are a problem in the post-op period. 
and this decentration may increase over a period of time as the capsular fibrosis progresses and this change may, may be taking place over the next two, two to three years. So uh, even if you feel that at two weeks time lens appears to be centered, there has been a little compromise of the capsule and you feel it is too not, not too bad, it's likely to worsen over a period of time. So if it is first eye or second eye, that also is again a, a challenging situation because in first eye, you can convert the patient to monofocal, but in second eye, you are like, under more pressure to somehow handle the trifocal lens. So the barriers to providing best visual outcome, uh, the preoperative counseling, the biometry for accurate IOL power calculations, best IOL material and type, a best surgery, a proper centration orientation of IOL and, and flax make it repetitively predictable. Be sensitive to residual refractive errors and be sensitive to mild PCO. Post-operative counseling and compassion to the patient is very, very important. And uh, what, what we have done is we have noted down the post-operative experiences of patients with trifocals in the vernacular language as they have explained. And then we have added to the consent and counseling. So if, if the, your patients are giving certain complaints in your vernacular language, you should add to the counseling and consent because other some other patient may also experience it. Uh, it is said that you should match the IOL to the patient. I have a little different view. I, I think you need to match the IOL to the surgeon. And it is the interaction of the surgeon with the implant, with the formulae, with the pentacam, with the biometry, and understanding the whole ecosystem that will help you to get better results. Never, never hesitate to say no to a patient. Never, if you feel in the preoperative that your, your gut says that this case may not do well, please shift onto monofocal. If the patient is not motivated and the patient is um, has little reluctance, don't force it on the patient. Now, what we, were, we used to discuss a couple of years back that uh, you should prefer a housewife or you should prefer a hypermetrope. Myops are not candidates for trifocal. Now, all those things are past. Uh, it, if your surgery is good and you have the tools to do it, those things don't matter. You can do it even for any person as long as uh, his, uh, his optical quality of the cornea is really good. He doesn't have any issues. And as long as there are no other contradictory or contraindications present in this case. How about the cost as a barrier? Now, cost of surgery remains a barrier for some patients. And in our country, this is very true. But it should not be a barrier for the ophthalmologist either to counsel or to offer the services. And believe me, the perfect results cannot be provided as economical package as the inputs for ideal surgery are too high. And it is uh, not a forgiving surgery. It does take your time. In, in, if you're for a monofocal, even your assistant can look at the bio, biometry and post the case for surgery. In a case with, with the trifocal lens, your workup time will be three to four times than your surgery time. So you have to add your time cost also to it, not only what it's what you are spending or what it, the, the consumables and instruments are costing to, you, costing to you. So this is something which is very demanding surgery where the perfection is, is the main thing. For that, you need tools. For that, the cost of the surgery is going to be high. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for giving those beautiful inputs. I think I will have the discussion after Shiddhartha takes over with the next speaker. Yeah, thank you, sir. That was really an enlightening talk. Uh, and uh, for the next talk, let us invite uh, Dr. Arub Bhomik, a uh, prolific surgeon. I should say he's a great surgeon and a great friend as well. Uh, we all uh, eagerly wait for your presentation. Arub, the stage is yours.
Arup, please unmute uh, so that. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. perfect. Uh, 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 it's a great pleasure to be present in the uh, in Calcutta Academy of Phenomenology uh, in this session. Uh, uh, so uh, I uh, this is my topic. Looking back to my presbyopic correcting IL, uh, so I'll focus in mainly trifocal technology at at least a technology. But uh, Dr. Buells are already discussed detail uh, regarding the, all the. Uh, the uh, parts of the trifocals and why you should not attempt trifocal I have uh, no inter no financial interest to disclose uh, so the the first concept of my uh, multifocal IL is uh, Kenneth Hoffer in 1983. And he had a decentered uh, IOL in cases of uh, uh, in cases of high myopic, and he had a both eye in both part was pseudophagic area and affective area. And first multifocal is came out. He able to see the both uh, distance with the affective and the pseudophagic area to the near vision. So uh, the first multifocal is uh, basically came in that year with the fusion of two IOL is a fusion of two optics, half optics. 18 and 21. This is how it can. And uh, and after that, we know that uh, we came uh, we uh, we came from the refractive design to refra diffractive design, and so far we have landed. So uh, quality of vision and uh, it's important to understand the, uh, the need of intermediate intermediate uh, uh, intermediate distance because uh, the, there is a gross lifestyle change in a couple of uh, years or last uh, almost one decade. And you can consider this a fast uh, multifocal IOL is a restore which launched in almost one and a half a decade back. And it has a uh, uh, addition of 3.2 at the at the spectacle plane. And, uh, and after launch, they can understand that they, they have to address the intermediate distance. And gradually they shifting their plus addition to two point five, but it, this technology is not enough to address as well near vision as well as the distance uh, intermediate vision. And this is the how we came. This is a physical. We uh, launched a trifocal technology in two thousand ten. And at least in 2012, and at least I came in 2013 with the with the Toric platform, and uh, and and Alcon Panoptics, which is one of the uh, market leader in the trifocal technology, he came in the 2017, and so far we reached. We have now have a non diffractive lead off lenses. That's uh, IHANS and Alcon VV, uh, VVT, which just launched. A few months back, uh, almost one month back. These are the technology. Now we are available. There is a, a much evolution of the bifocal technology, the trifocal technology. Last couple of uh, almost last one decade. Those who are trying to uh, practice the trifocal IL or presbyopia correct IL, they have to understand address the astigmatism very carefully because. There is a high she uh, presented paper, just only 0.5 uh, diopter cylinder can reduce uh, vision from 2020 to 20 by 30. So it is important to address the astigmatism however we want to practice the pace where we are correct in IO. And this is uh, 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 at least a line. It is came uh, at least uh, 89, which is launched on uh, 2011, and this lens is launched in 2013. It is a it is a uh, plate active design. It has a 360 NTPC barrier, and it is a addition power of 3.3 and 3.3 in and intermediate for intermediate distance. It has a 1.6. You can see this is a two focal length, uh, basically at the range of 40 centimeter and the, in the range of the 80 centimeter. And the next is the far. 
Well, if you see the uh, defocus curve, already Dr. Gelser uh, described how it is. It is a very good distance vision and very good near vision, and it has an intermediate distance as it is a 1.5. It is has an intermediate vision beyond the 60 centimeter. Uh, preferably, it is at 75 to 80, uh, 80 centimeter. And how it is what? It is a distance, intermediate and uh, near. Is so basically they how they divide the lens into into the focal length. Is a uh, if you has a focal length is a, is a why they have a half of the uh, power for the intermediate at the at, at uh, eighty centimeter and the next is the and the rest of the uh, uh, light for the distance. This is a technology of the restored 3D uh, diffract lens. They has a height. You can see that from the baseline, it is the height. But you can see that the technology this a come from the half of the height and then again, uh, uh, again uh, up to the 3.3. So that's why the halos and the photoptic phenomena is much less in in case of trifocal technology uh, less than the in the bifocal technology. So in Increase the number of presbyopia correcting lens is increasing in, 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 in even in India and this part of India also. This is because of it address intermediate vision, which is very important today, in other as well as the near and photopic complication is much less. And as Dr. Duels has said, we have a now the very good uh, machine. We, we, we can use the very good IL formula, which give us the confidence for uh, for the trifocal technology. We already discussed the very good macular pathology uh, you should avoid in case of dry eye, long-standing uh, diabetes. And these are the uh, these are the formula. I think uh, we should. Uh, we should keep the minimum myopia or minimum myopic spherical equivalent. So this should be the ideal to be kept in the in your refractive biometric chart. You should keep minimum myopia or minimum myopic spherical equivalent. We should exclude all the cases in cases of higher astigmatism or has a patient has a higher uh, higher order uh, aberration. So biometric machine and biometric formula is very important. So we have, I have encountered three type of patient. Uh, basically, they are some patient asking for the spectacle freedom. These patients are very critical. You have to spend a lot of a uh, lot of chair time to this patient. But some most easier patient, happier patient, and easy to make them happy. These patient very indifferent and they don't have any knowledge about the IOL, but they want the best one. These patients actually eventually become much more happier than the first group in the post-operative period. So in my experience, I so far uh, uh, did uh, almost approximately 200 uh, uh, trifocal IOL. The mostly is a panoptics platform and, uh, 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 and EDOF platform. And just I have just started uh, trifocal uh, at Elisa trifocal, and I have a experience of only only fourteen cases. But it has a very encouraging laser in if you consider the near vision. Near vision, there is a very you know, what I found in Visa Vis. I just uh, uh, started uh, another lens synergy, but uh, just implanted only ten cases, so I not kept uh, in, uh, in this. Uh, uh, chart the atelisa trifocal and panoptics and edophile all the distance which are almost equal they have a very good i don't find the edof lens a much better distance vision than atelisa or panoptics i find the atelisa has a very good distance vision and panoptics almost equal near vision i think panoptics and atelisa at the range of 40 centimeter almost equal almost equal intermediate vision if you consider the 60 centimeter 50 to 60 centimeter uh, say or uh, 65 centimeter i found the ed of lens and pan optic lens is better in the in the range of 60 centimeter but atelisa has a uh, much better vision in 80 centimeter where this uh, pan optics does not have in in 80 centimeter so those patients are actually uh, related to slightly uh, longer distance like if you uh, patient are uh, uh, is uh, 
love cooking and uh, or all this stuff they must be benefited uh, more than the other group in 80 cm and i found slightly continuous vision if you consider continuous vision panoptis is slightly better than atelisa and astigmatism tolerance these two lens has a minimum astigmatism tolerance so it we should keep the astigmatism less than 0.75 uh, or less than 0.7 but astigmatism tolerance lens ed of lens is much higher than the atelisa or panoptics and tips and tricks to implant the uh, plate haptic eye remember this is the we are habituated to the, the implanting this type of lens these lens are basically in 6 mm optic when it implanted in the lens in the ante chamber this is a basically 6 mm lens and gradually this spring to spring is open and it give you 12.5 but this lens is 11.5 cm yeah 11 so it is much bigger lens if you handling the lens eventually though it is a 12.5 this is a 11 the centimeter lens but when you handling this lens this is a much better lens so one criteria your rex should be very good very good means uh, i means it should not be less than 5 mm it should be more than 5 mm to handle this lens and visco implantation is very easy as dr bual said said he uh, used to implant the with this lens with helon or helon jv if you don't have the this helon helon jv so you have to inflate the with visco elastic uh, in uh, hpmc and you have to tampon it the uh, anterior chamber or inflate the back very well and next is hydro implantation uh, we, i prefer this hydro implantation the visco implantation very easy but uh, it's a uh, very difficult to clean visco elastic especially if it is uh, it is a dispersing visco elastic uh from behind the optic back because this lens is almost uh, plate haptic and very difficult to go behind the uh, um, um, go behind the optic the hydro implantation another option you can implant the hydro implantation i just give you two tricks to how to do a hydro implantation as it is a inject to to the 1.8 mm so you able to you never never try Uh, these particular plate haptic lenses wound assisted uh, delivery you have to uh, introduce the nozzle of the tip of the cartridge into the anterior chamber so whenever you implant the lens you or it is a, as a, it is a hydrophilic design you do carefully whenever it is come out of the 40% of the out of the is suddenly uh, unfold so it is very difficult to control so you just cross your mark and this this is a rexis margin cross your mark gradually slowly implant and see that it is goes into the uh, into the back and then you slightly recede keep your nozzle at the level of the uh, level of the uh, um, rexis margin and then you press your second instrument irrigation haptic to to uh, uh, implant the lens into the back small pupil very careful in this type of plate haptic design if you use the uh, pupil device it's uh, it is very difficult to implant it uh, in case of if you are not very careful it, it can dislodge your uh, pupil device and it is better to use iris hook if you implant uh, uh, this uh, plate haptic design this is a one uh, small video clip uh this how i i try to implant uh, this is i always implant uh, introduce my nozzle you can see this is a, i i make sure it is the leading to have this goes into the back you can see the sudden unfolding so it is better if you keep at least uh, uh, with the with one haptic into the back with this second instrument then it is very easy to implant into the back so otherwise if it once it is open into the anterior chamber as it is a 11.5 mm length it is very difficult to introduce into the back so so with my practice today in trifocal i was previously very exclusive i do used to exclude my patient from the trifocal but with invention of the this trifocal technology and now with of technology 
I am become more more inclusive, and I have a you have to be very inclusive mind uh, mindset to build your uh, presbyopia correcting lens practice. Thank you so much. Thank you for for giving us that you know practical tips of how putting in the lens because the mindset is that. You know that, uh, that this lens is uh, plate haptic. How will you put this lens as against the C loop? So let's come to our uh, expert panels. Where since the topic is triaging trifocal, and now which trifocal to wear? I first come to Dr. Parthav Biswas. Parthav, I think you have a huge experience of all the 2010-11 whatever the graph. Oruk has showed us, and you have gone. Yes, Parthav, I started trifocal in visual. <laughs> Yeah, line. So, yes. can you give us at this point of time what, how do you reach any particular patient? You go for this particular lens or this uh, any other particular lens? Since we have a, a plethora of lenses now. Yeah. So, uh, Arup, thank you very much for the talk and uh, Grewal sir's talk was phenomenal. It really encompasses where we need to go. And that last slide, the uh, Arup, that you have shown, the flight taking off, and uh, that's what all of us should be doing at this point of time. However, the best is yet to come. And I think at the end of all our discussions, we will arrive at that conclusion that the best is yet to come. But having said that, when I did start uh, the physiol uh, trifocals way back uh, so many years ago, as Arup mentioned, uh, it was a very good experience for me. Uh, it was a good experience with the limitations of everything that we had. We did not have the IL Master 700 at that point of time. We were very cautious, uh, counseling and recounseling and everything and choosing our patients uh, very well was important. But the, uh, the physiol also had an excellent uh, set of results and we had tabulated and we published it also. And um, somehow it did not stand the test of time. And that's when the panoptics had come in and the favor of the hydrophobic platform of the panoptics was uh, a real uh, good experience again for most of us. Again, because of the newer modalities of the biometers that were coming into practices, we could achieve more and more accuracy with all our refractive, refractive cataract surgeries. Thus came the way, and now we have quite a set. We have the ATLISA, we have the Synergy, and we are now having a very good competition of all the manufacturers coming up with their multifocal, the trifocal IOLs. Now, the, having said uh, this part, the important part for any trifocal is, of course, the pre-operative part, which is the 90% of the part of a successful trifocal uh, assessment and the uh, good outcome. So the biometers are important. Dr. Grewal already has told us about the biometers. He has all the three. The, he has the um, biometers, uh, the IL Master 700. He also has uh, the uh, Aladdin, I think you said, sir. Uh, you, you said the Aladdin also you have? No, Lens Star. The, the Lens Star you have. So we definitely rely on two aspects, the IL Master 700 and the Pentacam. And the coincidence of the Pentacam with the IL Master 700, that is a very, very important tool for, again, successful outcomes. But can I, without a IL Master 700, put in a multifocal? That would be a very basic question, and I think all of us need to answer that. I would say, yes, it is possible. But the repetition of the repeatability of the biometer biometry, as well as taking up the uh, optical biometry is important. The optical biometry is very important. The K1, K2 assessment is very important. Doing the biometry without putting any anesthetic drop before uh, doing a dilatation is 100% important. And in case of any doubt, Repeating the biometry is again very important. All this along with, of course, a good assessment of the posterior segment, the fundus, the macula, and the macular aspect where you need to even find out if there is any disruption of the ISOS junctions or not. Uh, 
the patient might still be enjoying very good vision and uh, six nine uh, corrected vision. Such patients again would be very demanding. Uh, with uh, sir, I, however, I would like to disagree on this fact that you know if the patient has a six nine vision in one eye and a six twenty four, we go ahead with a six twenty four vision correction and a cataract surgery in that eye. The six nine vision, we definitely need to do it, but again. The patient in that interim period is going to compare right eye and left eye. I think I'm seeing still better with my unoperated eye is one aspect that comes up quite, quite often. And I think uh, we need to prime our patient that after doing one eye, your eye would settle. It would have to get the marriage of the other eye to give your crisp and good quality vision. So these aspects definitely need to be uh, as, uh, uh, associated and correlated for a good outcome. Yes, yeah, that was wonderful, Parthoda. But, uh, you know, a very common uh, question is that, uh, what is the take home? Like, how do you choose which lens for which kind of what? Uh, mm -hmm. An avid reader or a surgeon who takes, uh, you know, uh, things into depth for, you know, they need a lot of depth perception. And uh, someone who is, you know, a found photographer, a driver, avid, uh, you know, he does a lot of night driving. So, which patient would be the, be, uh, you know, best suited for uh, bifocals, multifocals, or edo? How do you choose that? What would be the take home? So, uh, again, if we just uh, put off edo a little uh, apart and uh, talk about the two trifocals that are in vogue or the three trifocals that are in vogue today. So uh, again, the uh, ease of reading with the panoptics at 40 centimeters is much better. The ease of reading with the AT laser and the depth of vision of the AT laser to the intermediate is again much better. So here, uh, again, you have to prime your patient. You have to see which patient needs what. But by and large, both the AT LISA as well as the panoptics give very good outcomes. The AT LISA is an excellent lens. I've not used them as many as uh, the ones of the panoptics, but uh, they are really becoming quite a favorite of mine now. And um, the importance of choosing the patient to the lens is also quite important. EDOF lenses, again, when you want to tell a patient that I'm going to give you something better with the, a particular lens. The first requirement of most patients, for me also, would be, am I going to get the near vision corrected as well? EDOF will not give us that. But EDOF will give us good contrast, better than the contrast of the trifocals, which is proved, and an intermediate vision. But without a near vision correction, is my patient going to be happy? That I have to get that answer. Because time and again, if the patient is paying an X amount and says that, but I'm still not able to read without my glasses. So that is a disadvantage. So here we need to be very clear. But the clarity comes in because our patients are very well read now. And they go on to the net and say that contrast sensitivity is something that has picked up even with our patients. So if the patient is too worried about his contrast sensitivity, we'll say, yes, you have to choose. If you want good contrast sensitivity, let's go in for the EDOF and we compromise your reading and we give you good intermediate and distance vision. So here is the time when we need to explain to our patients, make them read, read up. It will do two things. It will give them good knowledge and it will confuse them to the utmost. And then finally, they'll say, doctor, you decide. Yeah, Shubhato, I think uh, you, like your inputs on the trifocal that you have tried out, again, triaging which one you put in. Yeah, my experience is mainly limited to panoptics. Unfortunately, I have used few uh, atelisa as well. So I have a few couple of questions for Dr. Griol, sir. Um, so that I gain confidence about using Atelisa as well. But before that, I think most 
of us who are not using uh, trifocal the surgeon the main fear is the uh, i think is the fear of inability to satisfy the patient with unaided good vision and in this situation i think we have to remember for surgeon it's six six n six we always talk about but for patient even if they have six nine or six nine part vision with good near vision they are quite happy so we shouldn't be unhappy if we don't get a patient with 6-6 N6 vision. That one thing I think we should remember before we start using trifocal lenses, those who are not using, because that is the greatest fear that not making the patient happy. And second thing I would like to ask, sir, that, sir, your survey showed that patient with atelisa are not very happy during the night driving and during the daytime. Daytime, I think the satisfaction was only 2.1 or something out of 5. Is it because of the larger diffractive zone uh, compared to panoptics? Because my patients whom I have used, I am very fortunate. I have very, very few patients who are complaining of these problems. So if you can, sir, enlighten us a little bit, that would be uh, very helpful. And also the other thing, as Pathoda has mentioned, though the aid of lenses give uh, good contrast sensitivity, they are probably going out of vogue because even for me, if I'm asked, I will uh, uh, the addition thing with the near vision, I'll ask for good, good near vision in addition to good distance vision. So uh, that's why probably as Patra has mentioned, the aid of lens is going out of vogue. And second thing, sir, your chart compared uh, all the lenses except panoptics and uh, obviously uh, the um, other lens with uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson, the um, Synergy is still too early to compare, but uh, uh, Oruf has given a little bit of hint about the panoptics and uh, it is a comparison. So if for a take-home message, how to choose between Ateliza and panoptics be, uh, when a surgeon have these two options, that will be very helpful if uh, you can enlighten us. Sir, you have to unmute, sir. Unmute, sir. Sorry. Now, as far as the question of the complaints or the survey that we have done is, there is a difference between what the patient complains to you versus, versus what the patient responds to leading question asked. So there will be some of the complaints which the patient is not complaining, but when you ask leading questions and fill up a questionnaire, then the patient, oh yeah, I have that also. So that way, when I look at the overall of 4.36, I'll put it as an uh, excellent patient satisfaction uh, with the trifocals. That is one question. Second is that out of, I, I started using the array a long time back and I had a patient who was on follow-up for array and that lady had one eye done and didn't come for the second eye. The second eye was still six, six and didn't develop cataract, but she was absolutely happy. She didn't have any problem. She was reading uh, without glasses, but those are exceptional cases. Uh, then at this moment, I am using only uh, two lenses. I'm using eye hands as my monofocal lens because it doesn't come in toric, so I use the technus toric with that, or I'm using the trifocal, AT laser trifocal, trifocal as well as toric. And as I mentioned in my talk, my tolerance is, I, I, I'll be using about 25 to 30% of trifocal toric. Uh, now there are a lot of issues involved into it, why I am sticking to one lens. First, out of the lenses that I use, this gave me the best uh, acceptance of the quality of vision by the patients in my hands. EDOF, I have stopped using completely. Multifocal, I have stopped using completely. So I'm only limiting to uh, Lisa Tri. I have used uh, some Synergy, good results, no issue in that. The, the issue comes with the logistics. Over a period of time, you realize that it is better to try a few lenses, see which one fits best for you or which one you're finding the best results because then it is the supply chain, the page, the keeping all the powers with you, keeping the toric powers with you, availability of the lens when the patient wants it. So when you're looking at the logistics, I find it more convenient to stick to one lens which is giving best results in my not. I have a little different view on selecting a lens based on the patient's need. I believe that the need for vision is the same for everyone. 
a, a vice chancellor of university say needs the same vision to earn his livelihood as a beggar on the street a beggar on the street would like to enjoy the sunset in the same way as the governor of a, of a state so let's that i for me every for every patient vision is very very important for every aspects so you need to have something uh, where you have a good good range of vision as was shown by the comparison of the two lenses uh, the trifocal at the moment is the way to go but it does have a little it, it's a trifocal it does have a little dip between 30 to 60 and it has a little dip 60 to 1 meter that is perceptible only to very intelligent patients most of the time they will do like this and then once you have a finicky patient then you will get surprises i had a lady i did surgery perfect vision crisp 6 5 and 6 but my near vision is not good i can't read newspaper so whenever any patient says i can't read newspaper my first reaction is to the my host please bring a newspaper so she brought a newspaper and she read it very well and you can't guess the what the reply was she said doc the newspaper i get at my home has a smaller print although both the newspaper are times of india of the same day so these these things also crop up you have to handle these patients and and i i believe that stick to one lens try a few see which one is is giving you the best results need of vision for every patient is going to be the same that should not be the deciding care criteria that someone needs this kind of a vision anything which gives you a good range will be good anything which gives you a continuous i i i would not like to at the moment as the uh, partha said that it is too early to talk about the synergy lens um, but whatever we have been talking over the last 15 years match the lens do micro mono vision one eye eda one eye trifocal all were due to what partha said that we are still a little distance away from the perfect solution the day we have a perfect solution the day we have a perfect lens the day we can get a good biometry and get good results and think all these things that we are discussing today will be a thing of past so that's how i look at the situation as the evolution is taking place our confidence for doing these lenses is is increasing and i remember in my early days i'll do do those multifocals i'll have good results my volume will increase then i have a bad patient then i'll stop doing it for a few days my confidence goes down and this is what was happening in the initial phases now now it is different if a patient want trifocal wants near could distant correction i'll do it thank you thank you sir thank you thank you uh, i'll have so, uh, some comment from our uh, the next panelist again a huge you no, know, it's been doing multifocals right from 2005 as I hear so. Dr. Arup Bose. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Grewal for giving such a insight and enlightening us and Dr. Womick <clears throat> for his experience. I'd been doing it since 2005 <clears throat> and I started with array and resume and all those things. As Partho has pointed out, initially we used to be very skeptical, spend a lot of time with our patients, uh, choose our patients right, and we used to have good results even with those lenses. Now with, with the newer technologies, we have become a bit more casual about uh, choosing our patients. And as uh, Dr. Uh, Siddharth Ghos has pointed out, that I'd never like to implant a multifocal in a patient who is an artist or who does a lot of driving and who is very particular about the color vision and contrast sensitivity. They are not the right patients. So not all patients are good candidates for multifocals. And another thing which I'd like to ask Dr. Greval, Dr. Arup also, that uh, if you are using too many multifocals, these multifocals has got a lot of complicated optics. As you see, some of the multifocals has 22 rings and they say it's giving good uh, near vision. And some of the lenses have got, are having 19 rings and they are actually confusing us with a lot of physical things. And this is the central button and this and that. So I'd like to like uh, Dr. Greval to clarify that whether the number of rings and these physical uh, properties of a lens uh, actually matter to us when you are choosing an ion. And another point which I had faced that I'd been doing uh, Pentacam in all patients and many patients who are above 60 years of age, 
I could see that they have got a posterior ectasia in Bella and Ambrosio, uh, this thing analysis, enhanced analysis. So if you get to see uh, uh, this thing, posterior ectasia or a yellow patch at the center of the posterior surface, posterior flood in uh, Pentecamp, should we go for a multifocal or not? Thank you. Now, the if if the if the petacam let let me put it like this: if the corneal, if the if the high order aberrations of the cornea are more than 400, 350, 400, patient is likely to have problems because you are changing one component, uh, one component of the eye, one component of the optical system that is the lens. The cornea still remain the same. If the optical quality of the cornea is not good, uh, then these patients with the trifocal, multifocal are not going to be very happy. So you should choose a patient in which the optical, in which the optical quality is very good. Uh, How to determine the optical quality? What actually determines? You do the high order operations on Pentacam. Most of the system, you see, the abrometers will tell you, and and most of the new ones will separate the corneal aberrations from the the rest of the eye aberration. So you look at the corneal abrometry. The Osiristi does it. The Pentacam does it. So, and if the if the high order aberrations are high. Uh, more than 350 micron, then those cases will have some issue in quality of the vision. Uh, second point is about the physics of the rings and etc. I, I don't think uh, any company clearly tells exactly what they are doing. Uh, even in a hands, we don't know how they are doing it. So it's very difficult to say based on the applied physics that which one is, is what. Uh, I have used some trifocals from Biotech, the Indian company, Biotech company from trifocals. The results are really good. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the results are really good. So, so I, I think in years to come, if they can maintain it and have more trials and they come out with the lens, that may be one of the uh, standard thing that you'll be using uh, in, in, in times to come. I think any, any any other question which I haven't answered, I think uh, I have there are There are a lot of questions from the audience, sir. Uh, sir. One question is, yeah, Dr. Sudhita would uh, start with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a question from the audience for Grival, sir. Sir, um, how many days prior to doing a surgery would you like to start uh, treating your dry eye in case you see a patient of dry eye and you still have to do a trifocal in that? This is one question. So I'll read out the questions for you. The second is, uh, if without flax, the rexus is not regular. So will you quit in that case, uh, doing a trifocal since centration is very important? And the third question, which I have not written, but it's here, is uh, as you say that uh, there might be a PCO, so we, we shouldn't wait, but treat it. Now, is there a particular size of the capsulotomy that you would advise since it's a trifocal and it has power in different uh, ranges? So... These are the three okay. questions. Okay, the first question of dry eyes, I'll I'll put it in a different chronological order. Uh, I'll say that diagnose and treat the dry eyes until it becomes all right. Uh, don't do the surgery. You may have to wait for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, depending upon the severity of the dry eyes, because it is going to affect your biometry also. So you treat the dry eyes, let the patient wait, whether it is two, three, four weeks, and only then take up for the surgery. The second part about the capsulotomy is that um, I, as a standard, I will do a trifocal only if the patient is willing for a flax. Uh, the reason for that is that these patients not only want to be spectacle free, they want to be spectacle free for a very long time. Right? So if the, if your capsulotomy is, is not central and circular, the overlap over the aisle edges is not uniform. And then as, as the Dick Bookert has also shown that with fibrosis over a period of time, there's going to be decentration of the lens. And these are the cases, if you see them three, if you see your cases coming three weeks, three years, two years, three years, four years later coming and having a little bit of refractive power, that is because of this region. So I'll, if, if I, it is not that during the surgery, if it becomes oval, then what will I do? I will not take a trifocal if a patient is not willing for flax. Okay, and sir, the PCO, and third, third question was about the PCO. 
as I mentioned in the talk, uh, the deciding factor is the patient's perception in change in the quality of the patient. The moment patient feels that there is a little issue in the quality of vision, uh, I'd go in for uh, the yeah, capsulotomy rather than looking at uh, the calling them on a repeated interval to see whether the capsule is okay or not. And if, if it occurs, it doesn't occur in the immediate post-op period. And it occurs later on, one, two, three, four years down the line. And if the patient feels the difference, he'll come back to you. And at that time, if the vision, there is a drop even of half a line from what it was. And uh, what, what I rely quite a bit on is a uh, 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 fundus uh, photograph. It will be uh, a surprise for everyone. Uh, we have the IDON, uh, which is a confocal, uh, non mid fundus camera. And it tells uh, the the crispness of the image tells me also that there is a difference. This eye has the patient says I have a little issue in my left eye, and I find that the the image is not as sharp in the right. I, I'll straight away go and do a capsulotomy. So the size of the capsulotomy. The question was on the size of the capsulotomy because it's a trifocal lens. I you just I, I personally I personally believe in doing a big capsulotomy irrespective of the lens. Otherwise, my retinal colleagues are after me. What did you do? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, Thank for answering you. Yeah, the questions. That was so enlightening. <laughs> and uh, okay, uh, I think in interest of time, let us move on to the you know case discussions, the challenging mm -hmm. cases. Uh, Dr. Ajay Pal, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gaywal. I think you stay with us. We'll have some discussion on the challenging cases. Yes, the host, please. Shogato, can you have the speakers? Yes, we have the first speaker, Dr. Obhijit Paul. He is the consultant of Disha Hospital and ex consultant of NNN Chaitanyapur. He's an MBBS, Honors, MS, and FICO, as you can see, MRCS and FICO in glaucoma. And he'll be presenting us a case of heart cataract and how we have faced this problem. Our next speaker is, yes, Dr. Shantanu Ganguly from Retina Institute of Bengal in Siliguri, a senior FAPO and glaucoma consultant. is done his MBBS and BO from RG Corps and MD from BP Koerala Institute in Kathmandu. He was previously working in Nepal and as a co-founder of Birathmore Eye Hospital, is a short glaucoma fellowship from Arvind Coimbatore and is a forerunner of refractive cataract surgeon in North Bengal. We have our next speaker. Yes, Dr. Priyansha Chatterjee. She is a DND from Narayan Netralai, an advanced cataract training in Shushrut, is a consultant in Shushrut, got the best paper of KOS 2007, 17, and third best in USI 2018, a city certification research ethics, and currently pursuing an executive MD and IMC Kolkata. That's a big feather. Yes, the next speaker is Dr. Nandini Chandak from AMRI. Kolkata BBI Foundation and Lyons Nathan Niketan is a cataract and LASIK surgeon. It's done at DND and MNS. And your discussion, sir. Yes, Siddhartha, please. Yeah. Uh, our discussions are, you know, uh, Dr. Swati Agarwal, and she is the director and chief consultant, uh, the Eye Clinic of Kolkata. She specializes in phaco refractive glaucoma and medical retina as well as LASIK services. She is the recipient of the prestigious Anutas Dotto Memorial Award in uh, 20, uh, 2009 and has several presentations, articles, uh, publications to her credit. Uh, we all know that she is a vivid speaker and in at various uh, state and national forums. Uh, she has been organizing uh, Welcome, Dr. Swati. And uh, the next discussion is Dr. Manoj Nath. Uh, she, uh, he did his MBBS uh, and post graduation from Assam Medical College, uh, Dibrugar. He has also uh, done his FICO in FICO cataract and uh, he did his fellowship in anterior segment and IOL from Arvindaya Hospital in 2008. Later, he worked as a HOD. Uh, for the cataract services in Arvindai Hospital uh, Pondicherry till 2019. And during this period, he was a cataract surgery trainer for many international and national candidates. And he uh, has also done his anterior segment clinical observership 
uh, at the USA in 2017 under Dr. David Chang and Dr. Geoffrey Tabin at Stanford University and under Dr. Alan Cattell at, at uh, Moranai Center. He has a large number of publications in both the international and national journals. He received the best uh, IGO award in 2020. And uh, presently, he is working as a senior consultant at the ASGI Hospital at Kolkata. Welcome, Dr. Nath. Our next discussion is uh, Dr. Arnav Das. He done his uh, MBBS and MD from uh, and is a fellow of the Vitruvian Society uh, and also a uh, uh, fellow of the uh, American Society of uh, Retina Surgeons. He is a senior consultant and trainer at Disha Eye Hospital, the largest eye care system in Eastern India since 20, uh, May 2001. We all know he is a prolific Vitruvian Surgeon, recipient of the Senior Honor Award at the ASRS and uh, a fellow of a, a recipient of this paper award at OWB and also at ISOC and uh, he has been and also at uh, the AIOC had received the best video award from OSWB and AIOC and has conducted and participated in many instruction courses in the state uh, and uh, nationally as well as internationally. Welcome, Dr. Arnav Das. And, uh, you know, the uh, other discussion is Dr. Sudipta Mitro, who is, Sudipta Mitro has been introduced before, so I actually doesn't need any introduction. She's also the and a prolific convention. And we all know she is a prolific and dynamic surgeon, as always, and an excellent uh, speaker. Well, uh, in this session, uh, the FECO challenges, and we are discussing, uh, we are going to discuss the case scenarios. Let us first invite Dr. Avijit Paul, and he will be uh, presenting the rocking rock hearts. Welcome, Dr. Avijit Paul. Yes, uh, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, Kolkata Academy of Ophthalmology, for giving me the chance to uh, show one of my case. And uh, firstly, share I your, uh, share your video. Yeah, I would uh, like to thank all my seniors to uh, share the, all the vast knowledge regarding uh, all the trifocals. So I'm starting my video. Uh, it, it was a case of uh, intermotion mature cataract. I stayed with trap and glue and I made a small leak and I tried to make a central small rexis first. And I made it easily. Then I tried to reduce some of the cortical matter to reduce the intermosis. Next, make it a cart with scissor, venous scissor. Then with rexis forceps, I try to enlarge the rexis. But in this stage, I faced a problem. Yes, see. Here. Yes. The rexis is extended. I tried. Once, twice, not coming. So uh, I stopped over trying. I tried to finish it from opposite side, making a small leak with cystitome. And I enlarged my rexis with micro rexis forceps. Now I have gone for chopping. Yeah, it's leathery hard. Yeah, separation done. Clearly seen, yeah. But I am facing a little bit difficulty as people become a little bit constricted. See the size of people. I have given intracommon adrenaline. It's around 4 to 4.5 millimeter. 
so i thought it will create problem so i i i i i, I thought i have to use some expander so i use bhex now the case become easy for me yeah i have done almost i have eaten almost all the nucleus part here one thing i have to point out here one of the flanks come out of people as i beaten most of the nucleus so i i didn't mind i continued my case now this is the time to place the alveol in placing i always give uh, extra attention when i uh, push the trailing haptic because as it is a uniplanar behex there is a chance of pushing the flanks and haptic together in the back so i was a little bit careful giving visco again i tried nicely placed now now it is the time to remove the behex it is a very easier technique as it is a nuclear one then done vigorous uh, ia and this is the end of my case uh, wonderfully Thank done you. dr abhijit wonderfully done very well done and very well demonstrated well uh, uh, firstly we would uh, like to get our comments from our first discussion uh, dr sudipto mitra sudipto yeah. thank you sudipto uh, yeah. da yeah yeah First of all, yes, uh, Obijit, that was a great job done. That's excellent. That was excellent. Uh, so, I, in fact, I I learned something from you too. So, uh, but then again, I would like to add certain points because um, maybe for the learners or the starters, uh, whenever we are dealing with some hard cataracts, we should be ready for certain things like uh, the one that you were ready with, the pupil going small. uh what i noticed a bit was that your anterior chamber was uh, not really equal in so it was little bit fluctuating in places probably that was one of the reasons why your uh, pupil went down because of touch of instruments or whatever uh i personally prefer to keep uh, the chamber closed and approach from the side port i usually go for the cystotome which i can pull out the uh, lens matter but then again that's a discretion but it's a personal choice so it was very nice of you that you wanted to extend it with a, a, a cut uh, of a vanus and uh, maybe a micro scissors would have helped you where it went went uh, wire a little bit but then it, you managed it well i would have uh, tried to do it with a winged manner so that i could have increased it and the different people do it differently one very important thing that i usually keep now is uh, viscoat i have no financial interest but then to keep my chamber stable i would prefer to have something that would keep my pupil uh, uh, keep my anterior uh, capsule flat on the uh, in the irish plane and it would not come up so that uh, it's very important so that pupil doesn't go here i'd like to push in more of it as i continue and suck more of the uh, liquid lens matter um regarding the uh, anterior chamber uh, stability it also helps and also during your chopping process where your people went down and your uh, keratom i mean your left side uh, chopper was touching the irish maybe if you had a better viscoelastic you could have pushed it and your people would have been but you did very well i must appreciate you so and um, maybe surgeons like uh, uh, senior surgeons whoever are here dr rajapal sir dr parth viswas sir shirdhar todar approval sir and the others uh, might have uh, managed uh, in this pupil without a bhex ring but then you put a bhex ring and which is a usual thing that uh, yes sir wants to see something as uh, sir is putting yeah, up his hand uh, yes sir that, uh, excellent surgery uh, i have just two additions to make first is that when the capsule rexus is going out uh the rescue of the capsular rexus is a very interesting uh, way to handle the situation so what you do is if it is going out you go with the force you go with the forceps hold it as peripheral as you can 
and with a jerky movement, with a sudden jerky movement, take it centripetally towards the center of the pupil and you'll be surprised that it comes back and completes it. Now the second, I'll not be saying that flax would have been a good situation to do it, uh, but I'll say that in a situation like this, my loop is excellent. Uh, you'll be able to divide the nucleus. You are not using the phaco power. There are not too much of fluidics going on. And you would have divided the nucleus into four components without affecting the pupillary size and without uh, having a need to use the, the BHEX in that. So that comes really handy in a situation like this. Thank you. Sir, and uh, regarding the BHEX, I, I think it's better to remove the BHEX when you're using a multi piece I will uh, before you really insert in the pupil size that you have because sometimes it does create some problems until you use your left hand instrument and put it down and then let it go so it's entangled so that's all but even then I must congratulate you for a beautiful surgery thank you ma'am thank you uh, yes sir yes uh, Dr. Patrick sir, sir please yeah. unmute yeah yeah, a quick comment, uh, very nice, uh, very, very nicely done. Um, uh, just one or two small points. So um, we are dealing with uh, um, a capsule that is running out. So the best uh, way to do it is uh, if it has to come in again. So from the side port with good uh, quality of viscoelastic and with the micro forceps to take it in. And uh, as Sudipta said, uh, the micro scissors also to complete it. The other thing that I noticed was uh, when you were putting the three-piece IUL, which again is going to inflate the bag or uh, stretch the bag. So I thought you uh, placed it at the, uh, one of the haptics was at the uh, place where it had run out. Uh, I'm not very sure on that, but I thought it was placed there. Maybe you would have circulated it and placed it again in a perpendicular axis, but that would be the right thing. I'm, uh, I don't know if you have done that. So because even if in that part, the rexus actually completes and becomes a uh, uh, full uh, uh, PC tier comes in, then it is always better that uh, it is there in the opposite quadrant. The other yes. thing uh, is uh, taking off the milky fluid so as that you have the intralenticular pressure as low as possible and taking it out in all the small, small quadrants in small squirts. So that also uh, is really helpful when you're dealing with a cataract like this. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, uh, any comments uh, yeah, from uh, Dr. Arubos, Dr. Sugatapal? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, OVJ, very well done surgery and you have shown such a mature brain of trying with other options of using adrenaline or sometimes you can use phenokin and then going for pupil expander so you didn't jump to uh, the your choices but you use in a stepwise manner so very mature surgery and you have shown that you have a very good hand and Sudipta has rightly added what needed to be added so um, that's it well done thank you thank you sir i think in that case we can come to the next presentation dr shantanu is it yeah yeah and the discussant will be dr swati yes i will look at his presentation Very good evening to uh, my seniors and colleagues and regards. And thank you, uh, Calcutta Academy of Ophthalmology, for providing me with, the, with this chance to present my study. This is a study done in the Science Institute of Bengal, Chilinui, uh, using uh, very uh, the image guided cataract surgery system. Uh, this is to uh, say how useful is image guided PECO with paired incision and planned incisions. And it was done on 33 cases. So as uh, Varian does, as it's an uh, image-guided system, first the images are taken and then planning is done in the reference unit. And then it guides the surgeon in the OT. So the image is a high-resolution image uh, that takes a picture of the iris ribs and uh, scleral vessels and which acts as a framework for 
the feature references. Then entering biometric data and that reference unit is done. The oil power is calculated and the, we get a, an estimate of the cylinder here. Paired arcs are like uh, opposite clear corneal incisions or limbal relaxing incisions, which releases and it flattens the steep axis. And here, if we had not used the paired arc, here we can see how much was the astigmatism. Here we can see in this particular case, it's minus 1.1 diopters and no arcs. But while using the paired arcs, the astigmatism is coming down to zero. Also, we had used a planned incision um, that is not using the paired arcs, just using a predefined uh, incision, a single incision in a predefined location in cases of small astigmatism. So this is the surgical planning. We carried uh, this picture and the rest of the data uh, transferred to the, to the OT digital marker. That is what we see and that's how uh, where we operate. This digital marker, now uh, the patient's registration is done with the two uh, small steps and now the uh, surgery starts here. This digital Overlays are important now here. This is the prime, uh, primary incision at 120 degree in this case. And this large arrowhead, uh, the small arrowheads demonstrate the site of the paired incision. One is at 167 degree and other one is at 47 degree. So this is a routine uh, pectoral mulch surgery. Emulsion is done. Followed by implantation of the IVL. Now the time comes for making the paired incision at this arrowhead, one here and the other here. The width of the incision was in this case 2.2 millimeter. And after they were nine millimeter apart, and after completion, this this was uh, carried out in thirty three cases, and we analyze the data on the following variables. The uh, first is before and after um, estimates of before and after surgery. Then measure the correction in dap 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 and then here we can see without paired arcs, what would have happened? Seventeen patients were expected to have over one dap of residual astigmatism. And with paired arcs, 14 cases out of the 17 cases had one diopter of correction. Here, the maximum correction was achieved 1.71 diopter followed by 1.62. And out of these 33 cases, 23 cases had no residual astigmatism. That comes to 70%. So, in our study, after surgery, 82% patients had more than one diopter of correction using this paired arc or planned incision, and 70% had no post-operative residual astigmatism. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shantanu. I think it was uh, uh, very well shown. Uh, Dr. Paul, yeah, he's there. Yeah. I think, uh, Shantama, I think we'll have the discussion from sort of Swati. I think I have some questions to her as the feasibility of, uh, I mean, we are so known to use this uh, digital markers or devices for toric islands. But here you have a, an excellent presentation by him where he has shown that even you can do it with the opposite clear corneal incision or paired incisions. We know that paired incisions would not work only up to a certain limit, but we have shown even in the higher order of estimation. So, your comments on them? Yeah, uh, so you're asking him. Fine. Yeah, I'm asking you, Swati, your comments okay. on. Yeah, 
So firstly, I, I would like to actually uh, ask uh, Mr. Sh Dr. Shantanu, like uh, on the variant on which, on which he has calculated, it shows it has the nomogram for uh, limbal relaxing incisions, but not for the OCCI. But what you've done is the OCCI procedure. So uh, the nomogram does not actually uh, is supposed to work. So have you followed the OCCI nomograms available elsewhere, which are at all internationally accepted? Uh, because these are totally different procedures. Firstly, the, 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 the nomogram of the variant is for LRI. Uh, secondly, uh, like when you are giving the OCCI of 2.2 millimeters, suppose within the superior hemisphere of the cornea, so the paired incision would be in the lower limbus, the lower half of the cornea? So if I am doing OCCI, this is not exactly OCCI. OCCI is when I am giving two incisions. Here, there is a primary incision and two, mm -hmm. two paired arcs. That's why it's called paired arcs. They, is, they are calculated by the variant machine itself. The machine guides that that's why my primary incision was in that case. For example, it was at 120 degrees. And the paired arcs were at 167 and 347. So this is purely not a OCCI, but kind of relaxing incision which the machine calculates the where to give. So that's why it's like it's a kind of... Okay, so the, what was the procedure for the paired arc? Was uh, yeah. it 90 degree depth or was it full uh, thickness? Like Usually, yeah, yeah, the machine machine guides to give it at 90 degree, but uh, we, we didn't do that. We gave a two and three incision. So, two and three. So yeah, that yeah. becomes clear corneal incision. Yeah, yeah, clear yeah, corneal right. incision. Like... Uh, huh. As part the you know the definition so of it's incision. Paired, so. cleared cornea incision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it is not. And uh, you're using uh, it for uh, monofocal. So why monofocal. don't you like you know think of go going for thorax and rather going for uh, paired uh, uh, clear so cornea incisions? We we did a case of panoptix with with this and we got good results because the, uh, in case of thorax and this, there is a certain limitation of this procedure that that hmm. even if we have got a correction of 1.71, which is maximum in this case, and the correction exactly depends on the width of the incision also. So max, hmm. hi, highest width of the incision was in this in our series, three millimeter. So there is a limitation that how much width can we, like, you know, so in OCCI studies, the maximum width was given 3.2, like previous old studies. And hmm. here, so we can't get beyond that. So to achieve a higher degree of toric correction, we need a toric lens. Suppose the toricity is 2.53, we don't advocate this. But in the range of 1.5 to below that, I think this is a good alternative because with that amount of cutting, like say 3.2, 3 we can achieve nearly 1.5 or something more. So Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, that is so, what. Uh, that, have you have has your study also seen the effect with age of the patient or how long this lasts? Yeah, the, this is this is one limitation have, of the study. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the limitation mm -hmm. is that we have followed up till the data have entered till uh, three weeks. The, when the last follow up we have seen it, it was third week data. Then I think mm -hmm. that is the limitation that we have to follow up these cases for say another one year, two years. Then we can get exactly how much because uh, there will be a lot of changes happening in the wood. So amount of casting batsman will also naturally change. But initially, if we go by this, I think this is a good alternative to toric correction in lower. Excellent, degree. Dr. Ganguly. Yes. So, so for low, lower degrees of correction uh, below 1.75 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. cell, yeah. you uh, are preferred yeah. to go for this. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, coming back to the question, Dr. Rajit Paul asked me, so, uh, so uh, my take is like I did a panoptics recently and the patient had a 0.75 of sill. So I did give an opposite OCCI and the patient landed up with six, uh, with six, six plano. No? Uh, but then again, those, uh, I, I did not want to go for a panoptic toric uh, uh, for 0.75 of sill, uh, cylinder. So uh, for those cases, I feel that, uh, yeah, one can go for an OCCI, though it, the results are not very predictable. You know, it all varies with the age and there's not there's no internationally accepted nomogram which we can follow for uh, OCCI. Uh, 
uh, a pair arc would be different and uh, for uh, above one if i have to go for a cylinder correction uh, i usually prefer to go for torx b2 t2 t3 and uh, even if the anterior corneal astigmatism is not uh, you know it doesn't show much of a difference uh, i usually put all my calculations on barrels and uh, take the effect of uh, pca also into consideration and uh, yeah for panoptic especially it's very good for monofocal again i would prefer to leave the 0.75 as it is and let the patient enjoy the astigmatic defocus but yeah, but yes i always prefer to you know operate on the steeper axis so that uh, the min, uh, minim, uh, there's minimal of amount of residual astigmatism in the cases uh, thank you thank you thank you thank yeah, you swati yeah, yeah. i can ajada uh, 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 can, can I just ask sir. for uh, how, how the, does he uh, use, use this digital marking system for doing OCCI or you know, LRI? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I I do I do LRIs and I'll do LRI for less than one cylinder. If it is one or more than one cylinder, I'll go in for toric. Uh, since I'm doing flax in most of the cases, uh, we do the uh, the non-penetrating intrastromal LRI with these cases. Earlier, I was doing penetrating and opening up, but then uh, there have been there have been two issues, problems. Uh, problems, and both the cases were wearing the the CPAP at night, and people don't sterilize it, so there were issues with that. So I'm doing non-penetrating along with the flax. In every case where it is less than one cylinder. The issue with the with the LRI is, I, I like the non-penetrating because then the fibrosis is, I, I like the non-penetrating, we leave 20 micron in front and back. Uh, there is less of fibrosis in this case. Otherwise, if you open it up and then there is a little bit more trauma in that, these cases will have a regression which will continue for up to one to one and a half to two years. So my preferred way to correct a significant uh, astigmatism at the moment is uh, to go ahead with uh, a toric implant as well as the with the as well as the marking of the axis with callisto is concerned um, i would suggest that the callisto should be calibrated every one to two years one Second is, Clisto is also not 100% correct. I have had surprises and uh, I have some videos where in one case only I have done it three to four times and every time the axis comes out different and then at the table you are at a loss that out of these which one is the correct. So Clisto is an excellent tool uh, but then it has to be used uh, also carefully and with a little word of caution. A manual uh, uh, LRIs I have not used. Thank you. Thank sir, you. I have a question. Yeah. Yes, sir, sir. What is in the experience about dry eye post LRI? The patient complaining of foreign body sensations. You see, if you are doing penetrating, if you are doing penetrating, that means uh, it's going through the epithelium. Then patient is likely to uh, right have to some foreign body sensation or so. Definitely. Yes, I did have a penetrating one is non-healing the corneal, I mean, the arc was more, many times when you're doing those arcs in the temporal aspect, patients do uh, start complaining of that ghost image and all, I think. And uh, part two at a point. Yeah. Uh, so uh, very nice presentation and it gives us a, a lot of, you know, scope for discussion. Uh, Shantanu, nice presentation. Uh, Thank you. The OCCI is something that we, you know, all of us, I think, have tried uh, at some time or the other. And then gradually, gradually, the importance of OCCI has become uh, short and shrunk now. So basically why? It's because of the multiplicity of manufacturers who are making the toric IULs. So a toric IUL, even from the, our indigenous manufacturers, give excellent uh, results. So it's not that we need to go in for the, uh, the ones uh, which are, you know, Alcon or uh, JNJ and things like that. But if a, a, a patient cannot afford that, even a toric eye well, over one diopter, 1 1.5 diopter onwards, very, very good uh, um, correction and which is a stable correction for years. 
that was one now uh, we had um, both ajay and I, i we had our experiences with the varion now the varion system we tried to accept and think about whether we could put it into our system and uh, the problem with varion is that it does not have the inbuilt biometer and because it does not have the inbuilt biometer and the a uh, the a reading the uh, axial length is something that you have to uh, transport and put it in and then uh, you know get a biometric calculation very often what we found out is our own trusted biometer even our ultrasound biometers were giving variations with the varion uh, biometric assessment so it was then that we you know actually shifted back again to our uh, you know biometers which we, at that time we were using most of uh, the ultrasound biometers which were giving excellent results all the same and now with the opticals it uh, definitely gives however i think um, alcon is coming up with the inbuilt biometer system with the varion and that is something that we would definitely uh, need to wait for yes sir uh, uh, almost 700 uh... Sync with the Callisto. That's what I want because that's the one of the you know great concern we had with the biometry. Doctor Grewal, sir. Um, I I just wanted to add to what Doctor Partha said, and thank you, Partha, for uh, mentioning the Indian Toric IOLs. We have experience with with these. They are just excellent, and I I I'll suggest that. the the tolerance for this astigmatism should be again very low one diopter even if it is i i had a many times i had a talk with the biotech also that why don't you give a give a toric 4.75 also and if we if we current if we can correct the the cylinder completely the post operative results dramatically improve and i must compliment uh, partha for raising this point and uh, encouraging people to use the indian toric they are really good Yeah, sir. I had a question. Is the R Master seven hundred synced with the Callisto? I mean, is, is it uh, something like that? We are talking about uh, the Varian being not having a biometer itself by its own because Varian is coming out with. But is the Callisto? I mean, can you directly put it, or you have to manually put it? No, you uh, can with the with the EQ new. You can, and if you have the the their um, the forum, then the data automatically goes there. So there is no transcription. So, so, so you see, like we have the forum and we have the Zeiss uh, server, and all our OCT OCT machines from glaucoma, from retina clinic, the IL master, the Callisto, everything is kind of a common platform, and we have also linked it with our EMR. So when a person gets uh, registered at the reception, and he has made a payment for any of the tests on the Zeiss machine. the name of the patient and the pro the and the test that is to be done pops onto the machine at the same time so it's a good environment good seamless environment to work with and the retina consultants can uh, review the oct sitting in their room also thank you thank you i think we we'll go to the next presentation siddharth yeah let us uh, now welcome dr priyanka chatterji for her presentation she is going to present a interesting case all was well until this happened okay uh, dr priyanksha yes sir. please share your presentation you can go ahead now good evening sir and thank you for giving me the opportunity i am i'm sorry there's a Is the video visible, sir? No. Yeah. Come yet? You have just. The video has not come yet. Yes. Now yes. it's all somewhere. Then you just have to take a call him on the arm, and then he's looking around, and suddenly he turns around and sees. The ball on the so uh, sometimes in life you have these unexpected clean bowl moments, and this is what happened to me in both my cases. The first case was a NS4 hard brown cataract, and uh, these are the most difficult uh, cataracts for me to operate. I decided to do a bowl and chop technique in this case, 
and FICO emulsification was going as per plan. I finished the emulsification and the cortical clearing. And I was very excited at this stage that I have uh, finished the case well. I implanted the IOL in the bag and in the final few seconds, just before closing the case, on attempting to remove the viscoelastic, uh, I made a bit of a mismaneuver and my aspiration port goes and catches onto the posterior capsule and a rent is created immediately. I see the IOL decenter. On examining the, uh, I see a large PC rent in the center and the pupil also has come down by then. So I decided to uh, place iris hooks, improve my visibility and then place a three piece rigid PMMA IOL in the sulcus. Uh, it is a good idea to uh, improve visibility to the maximum uh, extent possible while managing such complications for the best outcomes. I proceed with a uh, clean up uh, anterior vitrectomy and close the case. Fortunately, the patient had good vision in the post-op period. The second case was a NS3 grade cataract with a well dilated pupil and phaco emulsification was proceeding in a routine fashion. Emulsification. And then most of the cortical cleanup was complete. I had one uh, piece of uh, cortical sheet remaining, which was difficult and being stubborn and I was not being able to get to it. And in an attempt uh, while manipulating, I suddenly noticed a PC rent at the center. It is very disheartening to have a rent right at the end of the case because you're not expecting it. Since the uh, rim was intact, I decided to place a three piece rigid PMMA IOL in the sulcus, but as luck would have it, it wasn't my day that day. While dialing the IOL into the bag, I ended up extending the rent further. So I had to remove the IOL, complete a uh, anterior vitrectomy thoroughly, and then place an iris claw IOL. So I finished the case with the anterior vitrectomy, a peripheral iridotomy, and uh, sealed the wound with a superior suture. So this is what I learned from all these cases that one must never be too ecstatic. Even when things are going right, anything can go wrong in a cataract surgery till the patient has walked out of the OR. And something like the Murphy's law, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Priyanka, that uh, those were really uh, very good teaching cases. And uh, let us go straight to Dr. Manasnath for his uh, uh, comments. He is, he is going to discuss this case. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Priyanka, I mean, uh, both of the cases uh, were quite uh, difficult and uh, uh, very hard, and you managed uh, the FICO part quite uh, nicely. And in the first case, as you have mentioned, I mean, it was a really hard cataract. FACO went on very uh, nice, but uh, until you notice the IOL tilt. And uh, probably, as you have mentioned already, that uh, your aspiration port was below the IOL, which was uh, one of the culprit. And probably you have tilted uh, the cannula so that the tip was uh, I mean, near, near the PZ and it might have caught the capsule. So uh, my suggestions will be that uh, whenever you notice this kind of IOL tilt, uh, don't allow the chamber to collapse suddenly. I mean, don't take out all both the instruments uh, together, uh, put viscoelastics, and then take take out your irrigation cannula. Because if you uh, if there is sudden uh, chamber collapse, uh, the intervitreous phase may rupture, and vitreous will come, and probably and uh, also it will enlarge the PCR as well. And uh, another thing is that. Uh, uh, Removing the viscoelastic from the IOL, uh, below the IOL probably I prefer uh, the irrigation cannula. Take it below the IOL and just wash it out uh, with the irrigation. And even if you are taking a aspiration cannula, you should be very careful. Your tip should not be uh, 
it should be facing the i mean up it should not uh, it should not be tilted and probably a little bit of low aspiration will also help but uh, suggestion will be that take the irrigation canola below the oil and just wash it out whatever the fiscal elastics are there and uh, also i appreciate that uh, i mean as the people was coming down uh, instead of struggling in uh, like in a small people uh, you just put the iris hooks you increased your visibility and uh, knowing that the sulcus is adequate and then you uh, went ahead with uh, placing the lens that's good and uh, regarding the second case uh, as you as uh, the catter was really hard the pico pod was excellent and but i noticed that uh, the cortic aspiration you are doing it uh, too peripherally where the visibility was uh, very poor so uh, for the cortex aspiration hold it the anterior leaflet bring it to the center and then aspirate with your uh, you know, i mean in the safe zone rather than in the periphery where the visibility is quite less and uh, probably there itself uh, you uh, the aspiration port was probably it was again tilted and it might have caught the posterior capsule in that case also in second case also uh, you have taken out both the instruments uh, you have allowed the chamber to collapse and uh, should have injected viscoelastics before removing the your irrigation canola and uh, and then probably uh, i felt that you uh, were over inflating the uh, entire chamber with viscoelastics and probably it has uh, might have because of uh, uh, too much of inflation the av i mean the interpreter space might have ruptured and probably the pci might have enlarged i don't know i mean whether there was any vitreous disturbance or not i could not appreciate but that's what i feel like that and then when you uh, place the lens uh, probably the one haptic went uh below the axis margin or probably below the uh, pcr that's why it was not stable otherwise if the axis margin is there the iron should have been stable so yes. as the haptic has gone below the pcr margin it was not stable and while taking it out uh, probably probably you uh, you lost the back and then at time you and and later part i mean you managed it quite nicely you have placed a claw lens you did not uh leave the patient epic kick you have done a pi also that is very good and you have sutured the wound which was literally larger side you have sutured it very good and uh, the thing is that all is well that ends well in both the cases and i feel that the i mean the end was excellent thank you thank you sir thank you thank you dr nath wonderful yes. points made uh can we have a, a quick comment from dr arup bose sir from the expert panel uh um uh, yes uh, there are two things which are actually very important when you are in in a problem problem situation like that first is a deep anterior chamber and then a good dilated pupil <clears throat> even in the second case i thought if you had if you could dilate the pupil see the age of the um, anterior capsule then putting in a rigid lens on the anterior capsule would have been much easier and the lens, lens uh, wouldn't have uh, displaced on 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 any side as dr nath has pointed out because it must have gone either uh, uh, behind the anterior capsular edge or inside the uh, posterior capsular tear so that that's why the lens was displaced so these are the two things you should keep in mind whenever you are in trouble one is a good and a good well filled anterior chamber not overfill and do not uh, try not to disturb the vitreous and also a good dilated view of what, whatever is going on in the anterior chamber thank you thank you wonderful points made uh, any other comments from the expert, expert panel uh, dr parthaviswas dr yeah, uh, so priyansha uh, very nicely done you know you showed the steps very very well so really great uh, if i have to add anything so i would just say that uh, you know while you were doing vitrectomy so tramsilurone assisted vitrectomy is the way to go and uh, that uh, you know whatever is not visible becomes visible as soon as you put the tramsilurone and uh, then you can do a very clean job and uh, it's also very very good for the cornea next day the cornea is much much better because this has been a elaborate surgery it has taken time uh, there has been much of tissue handling yet the cornea is in a much better shape because of the steroid used in the anterior chamber 
Okay, okay, sir. Great point, great point. Right, if there are no more comments. Uh, 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 I want to uh, comment uh, regarding the first case. I mean, the I mean, uh, there was just want to make uh, two points only from my side. Uh, I mean, FECO in a access extension is uh, uh, quite challenging, and the two things which I would have done differently is that uh, uh, I would have never allowed the chamber to collapse because when it will exist here, certain chamber collapse uh, will definitely ch chances are that it will land up in a wrap around. And the another thing is that. The nucleus rotation should should be as minimum as possible. Think that uh, we are handling or we are dealing with a postpolar cataract and do like that. Very minimum rotation and uh, uh, never allow the chamber to collapse. That's it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. If uh, there are no more comments or questions, let us move to the next uh, case presentation. Doctor. Yes, Nandini. Doctor Nandini Chandra will be presenting this case, heart cataract. Yes, Nandini, please. And I'll stop you in between before I take a comment from the uh, from your discussant. Dr. Arnav, are you there? Dr. Arnav, yes. Yes, 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 I'm there. Yeah, fine. So at the outset, I would like to thank Kakao and Sir for giving me this opportunity to present this case. This case was done at the beginning of my FACO uh, training. So uh, there are a lot of steps which have been shown as a trainer which went wrong. The first, if we see the rectus was complete, it was a round circular rectus. And as Priyanka uh, actually said, we are in an ecstatic state when we are actually doing our first few papers that when uh, we, can, we can just see the glow that is supposed to be seen, the golden, the, the orange glow. Till the time the orange glow is not seen, if you see, I've been going on and on deeper and deeper doing the culture. So overzealousness in the beginners is something which is common and which leads to an oops situation. Yes, can you stop it there? Yeah. I think we are going to have a PCR. Is this an or not? You are seeing it as a posterior segment surgeon, and yeah. she is looking for that orange glow. But was the movement enough? Was the movement more than enough? Or I mean, your comment here. Uh, is a uh, is a uh, apo plus retina surgeon also. Not on I'm here. basically a retina surgeon. Yeah, I know. You also do a lot of does some fecos, uh, more of those uh, combined cases. But uh, I mean. Uh, we must remember, like in uh, the hyper hypermature cataract, is always a tough ask. The anterior capsule, the posterior capsule, all of that is friable. Uh, this one uh, it seems to be a relatively hard nucleus uh, and a thick one, uh, where the surgeon and uh, this is not a recent surgery. She mentioned that she she was doing it as a, a trainee. Then uh, she was kind of trying to go deep so that she can. Uh, uh, divide the nucleus uh, uh, with uh, less traction on the zonules, but uh, probably that's where she went wrong and probably, uh, as she has mentioned herself, that she was overzealous and uh, she went in a, a bit deeper, more deeper than what uh, could have been acceptable and probably the FACO uh, tip uh, touched onto the posterior capsule, which anyway could have been friable in this case. And of course, that we will not know because uh, the posterior capsule was not visible if because of the case of a hypermature cataract. Yes, you continue. Nandini. So, so I have managed to get a good trench and I have divided the nucleus into two halves. Now I felt that there was something which went wrong. So I was trying to magnify, but there was no rent. So I proceeded and I uh, made the second pass. Till now, I was in my happy zone because I could hold the nucleus, divide it into the quadrants, and continue with my phaco emulsification. So it was a hard mature cataract. It was a white cataract. But even when I could get the pieces into four halves, I was happy. I did not realize that the pieces were flying away 
instead of the followability. Yes. Could, you, could you stop it? Could you stop it? Yes or no? Yes, the, 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 that, uh, that followability uh, not happening the way it should uh, uh, is suggestive of vitreous in uh, the entry chamber. And uh, even the uh, uh, fragment movements, uh, uh, like rotation, which uh, uh, at least on the video appeared to be yeah, a little yeah. uh, staggered, uh, uh, that also is suggestive of PC disturbance. Uh, but again, I mean, I can't be sure on that because here is a beginner uh, who is... Uh, in her initial uh, FECO uh, uh, cases. So <laughs> whether she was tentative, that's why the fragment movements yes. were not as smooth or whether there was a PC uh, disturbance, why the fragment movements were not happening, that I cannot say. But I mean, but definitely if the fragments are not moving, rotating the way they should, it could suggest of a PC disturbance and volubility not being there is a strong, strong sign of uh, this thing uh, of, of a vitreous disturbance until and unless your uh, FECO uh, probe had got choked by a very hard cataract uh, that only if you primed it then uh, that part could have got cleared but definitely it was not that hard a cataract so uh, the FECO probe wouldn't have got choked here it was the vitreous disturbance which is not allowing the followability to happen so what you what do you suggest as a as a posterior segment surgeon so that nucleus doesn't come to your zone so what what corrective measure or does he I mean this is almost even we have not removed a single pi also I mean almost the whole of nucleus is there but you are sure or unsure that there is a vitreous there so yeah I mean uh, for for a, a beginner if it was a beginner who is operating then definitely convert to an SICS convert uh, to an SICS at this stage at this stage and uh, else if uh, for a very uh, experienced, experienced surgeon, surgeon I mean then you can put in an IOL and then do the FECO over the IOL. So right now, uh, almost three quarters of the nucleus is there. Uh, how, how, how does he? I mean, he has to take that out. Uh, I mean, somebody like me, somebody like any any of these expert surgeons. What does he do? I mean, can you can you continue a bit there, Nandini? Uh, no, uh, yeah, yeah. So now, now, yes, now, now, stop it, stop it. Yes, now. For for a person like me, I mean, I I, I am sitting with. Uh, my no, 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 and cannula, no, no, I would have gone. No, most of us have, do not have a weird no, no, I, What I am saying that even, even most centers have some uh, makeshift vitreous arrangements. So, uh, uh, before, I mean, the, for, for what I said, I mean, before putting in an IOL scaffold, I would have first gone in and emptied a bit of anterior vitreous and then I would have tried any Absolutely. of what I said. So, now we just saw a nucleus piece already going down. Now, now what? Oh, now I mean, what? if. if if the nucleus piece has gone down, then stop. As no, as you as have as already as seen as a small piece has gone down. Now, now, what do you advise the expert surgeons over here, anterior segment surgeons who are not a VR surgeon? Again, convert uh, or? I mean, uh, if it is a very small, if you think that it's a very small piece which has gone in, you can still go ahead. I mean, if you think you can come out safe with the other uh, fragments, uh, but it depends on the size. As uh, Anything uh, more than... Uh, one one fourth the nucleus would be uh, definitely not acceptable. You would fi finally need it to uh, come to the retina surgeon. So if it is kind of a one sixth or a one eighth of a nucleus which has gone down, then you can take a chance. But okay, anything more than one fourth, I will not accept. Let's continue, uh, Nandini. So, so I did not see that small fragment going down. I thought it's, I had emulsified the, the piece. So this but, is one fourth which has gone down straight. Yeah. So now, but you can see the uh, already. I can see the enlarged opening. And well, you are continuing it. Yes. As a beginner, I was happy that I was getting the pieces, and I, and by the time I realized, I was like as much of the fake I could do. I wanted to complete that off before I heard Arnav sir screaming that leave the case and send it to the VR person. <laughs> so just before that, yes, or no? I think yes. most of the surgeons sitting here would have seen that uh, I am having an impending drop. I'll yes. be if I continue there. So what do you advise as a VR surgeon? Do go too fast, or not? Do a vitrectomy, take that out, bring it to the anterior chamber, the remnant, or what? Or come on, let it come to me. Because now at this stage, well, definitely it is the, it is the call of the VR surgeon. But before that, I just thought about that thirty seconds or one minute before that. No, I mean, 
tell you something before you reply yes, yes, ajay yes. is giving you all the leads to say that ah. just send it to the vr surgeon send it to me don't <laughs> wait to have the whole nucleus go down why don't you upfront say that <laughs> yeah that's all that's all I was, because already one piece is gone down would you advise me vr anterior segment surgeon oh. now to do all the ion scaffold take it out See, see, after that, for an for 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 an anterior segment surgeon, uh, an endophthalmitis is always an uh, inflammation, and a dropped nucleus is always a dropped epinucleus. <laughs> so more often than not, so <laughs> that's the kind of message we get. I mean, there is a bit of epinucleus which has gone down. Please take out, I put the lens, and then we find fifty percent of the nucleus behind. So I yeah, mean. I Now this is the area of I think we'll see through the VR, but again I'll come to the other panelists. Yes, yeah. Arup. And the, just when the, when, when we the when the nucleus off. was not moving well, uh, the first thing we we could have done was inject uh, uh, dispersive viscoelastic, uh, clear the area, see the position, whether we can continue with phaco emulsification or not. At the same time, tampon at the posterior, or the opening in the posterior capsule. <clears throat> at the same time, bring down the bottle light to as low as possible, and with very low uh, settings, with slightly higher uh, phaco power and low vacuum and low flow rate, you can continue. Uh, uh, and and that too, and in the iris plane, and not at the posterior capsular plane or in the back. So and inject uh, vis uh, viscoat or dispersive viscoelastic repeatedly. That's how we could have managed the case uh, had we, uh, if we could have identified it at the first stage when there was a suspicion of a posterior capsular tear. But after the lens, the the opening has slightly gone big and the movement has come down. There's no other way that you'll have to stop it. And if the nucleus has not gone down, you can you can convert it into a uh, this uh, SICS and take out the nucleus, or you'll have to send it to the vitreoretinal colleague. There's no other way. Yeah, to go to again one minute before this, where where what would you advise? Because the respit was not that big. Could you have taken those uh, two fourth of the nucleus out or do, done a part plan approach? नंदिनी डिड नॉट रियलाइज दैट द फर्स्ट फ्रेगमेंट हेड गॉन डाउन but you know when you realize that one fragment has gone down that has to be vitrectomized and that has to be taken out uh, the vitrectomy has to come in and that fragment has to be taken out so here comes the question is if my uh, vr colleague is there just beside me on the next door on the next ot then i transfer the whole case to him you take care now if i do not have a vr surgeon in the vicinity of say 5 kilometers what do i do so these two situations are very different so one is if the vr colleague is just there by next you just take it over and do it off so but if the vr colleague is not there with one fragment that has gone into the vitreous 3/4 of it is still there what should i do so if it can be transported if the uh, uh, the patient can be transported same day what i would say that transported same day to the vr colleague who is ready to take up the case same day with the nucleus there and it is not going to do much harm at all so the vr colleague takes out the nucleus in the which is still there in the anterior segment does a good vitrectomy and places the lens in the sulcus which is nice and intact but if you have something when you have the whole nucleus that has fallen in then of course there is no other option but you send it off to the vrc after yeah. the you reason you resonated what what i was trying to say that anything more than 1/4 if it has gone down anyway we'll need a vr surgical intervention so there's no point struggling more and exactly. as regards 
sending it to the vr surgeon yes i mean if it is the same day within uh, and the next couple of hours great but even if you can do it in the next two days i am uh, i'm assuring every anterior segment surgeon here that nothing no no uh, it will not affect the outcome provided you have given the patient uh, diamox and you have given a subtenant tricord on the table if you cannot give oral steroids i mean okay, yeah. Uh, uh, two, two days of delay even with a full nucleus will not will not spoil the case in terms of functional outcomes okay. oh, or not that is really speaking like the vr surgeon who is who has a halo around his head that's what we wanted you to do yes. yeah please continue continue let's let's see what onno has done in this case once the case is there yes nandini so now the case was shifted to the vr ot where the nucleus uh, drop was managed by the vr surgeon the phaco fragment was uh, done and a rigid iol was placed in the sulcus Yeah, thank you, Nandini. I think uh, before we end, I think uh, we will have a few comments from Anub also. Again, the the, the tips of doing the tracheotomy and where the anterior segment, how much should be left for the anterior segment surgeon. No, as as Parthika mentioned, uh, uh, the uh, I'll just uh, yeah, as Parthika mentioned, uh, the the anterior vitreotomy always should be assisted uh, by a. Uh, uh time slow on uh, because that clear things uh, uh, to a great extent and quotient things down for the next day that is a very uh, good point which came from parthoda uh, and uh, uh, i mean uh, and now with the small gauge uh, uh, vitreotomy systems man i i would suggest that i mean uh, most people should do a pass planar approach man i mean if not two ports i mean you can have the ac maintainer through one of your side ports and then go in with one sclerotomy uh, proca cannula uh, 25 gauge 23 gauge whichever you have and go in from the pass planer uh, because that clears your anterior vitreous in a much better way and with much less fraction vis a vis uh, your uh, manipulation happening only from the uh, uh, limbal root uh, to the anterior chamber so that is one thing uh ajita what more do you want to know yeah that's that the part man the anterior segment surgeons going to the parsnan approach at least in this case this no, was a difficult yeah that's what i'm saying i mean don't don't i mean your your cutter is preferably uh, placed in the pass planer uh, because that gives you better accessibility and it ensures that there is less attraction on the anterior vitreous and uh, two points just uh, i am not a fan of uh, nucleus uh, fragment flotation which uh, some anterior segments do i have seen lot of uh, complications happening later uh, uh, although the surgeon has come out clean uh, for the initial 3 months even 6 months even a year but uh, things don't um, more often than not don't stay good for too long and also i am not a fan of iris claw lens uh because uh, whenever you are putting in an iris claw lens obviously there has been a pc disturbance entry which is disturbance so uh, there there is at least a 20% 25% chance of uh, an rd happening uh, no, no matter how how much we don't want it there is that possibility and when it happens then that iris claw lens becomes a big headache for us vr surgeons because you can't keep it uh, you have to remove it and removing it becomes a herculean task Yes. Okay. Or no one one problem that we normally face when there is a PC tear or there is some manipulation in the anterior chamber, the eye tends to become a bit soft, and putting in a trocar becomes a bit uh, difficult. So how do you uh, manage that? Uh, that 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 is that is a point. Yes, yeah, exactly. Viscoelastic. Uh, you uh, you stuff your anterior chamber with viscoelastics, and these twenty five gauge trocars go in pretty smoothly until it is it's not been used. too many times yeah, if it's uh, new it's fine if it's being used no, for no, no. More, twice or thrice then up to, really up, up to twice or thrice or of that is okay okay 
up to twice or thrice is okay. So you recommend twenty five gauge vitrectomy in those cases? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, because those are not uh, fibrosis; those are just form vitreous. Anyway, thank you, thank you for giving those beautiful inputs in this. As we have almost crossed the time, I would uh, request our uh, chairperson, Dr. Peter Bakshi, sir. I think you have been listening to all these. Uh, newer things and the way that people are managing, which you have taught us to manage the vitreous, have taught us to how to do an outflexes over a period of well, time and the trifocals. Well, we Ajay and uh, Siddhartha, thank you very much for putting me on the chair as a chairperson. And I was literally sitting like a chairman in the chair, doing nothing, uh, except realizing how things have changed over the years since I uh, uh, took a back seat. And I, it gives me a real pleasure to see such a beautiful bunch of young surgeons in the eastern area, in eastern zone of uh, India, doing so well in the modern stage cataract, refractive cataract surgery. And it, it's uh, 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 eye-opening for me to see how uh, beautiful the trifocals and the multifocals are working. Because when I did the restore lens was just coming in the market at that time when I left. And now with trifocals and what Dr. Greval uh, said, it, it's beautiful. And I'm sure that when I get my cataract surgery done, uh, I will have a trifocal in my eye. That's for sure. And, uh, but uh, uh, things will change even more, as Dr. Greval said, with the uh, uh, modern uh, instruments, more uh, reliable and more sophisticated instruments are coming, not only for diagnosis, for uh, surgical and all that, and the robotic surgery is also coming on the way. So I think things will improve much more and give better results to the patient expectations, which is going higher and higher. So I, I think we are all prepared to take the challenge. Thank you very much for uh, let me share the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you, everybody. I think I hand over to the session to Dr. Shudita Mitra, the convener, and the secretary. Oh. Gita, if I can just have one word before uh, you take over. Definitely. Definitely. I, I think uh, what uh, sir said, uh, there is nothing more that could be said. But what I think one statement that all of us can make and with hand on your heart, that, sir, you ushered in this change. The change was ushered in by you. So all of us have learned from you, still are learning, and now we are also learning from Pastor, the next Pastor, generation. <laughs> I will interrupt you there. It's I was there at that time, at the right time, at the right place. And I was in that big gap, which was there in the eastern zone, and I had just come back and I realized what the gap and I tried to fit myself into it, adjust into it. And then you people just joined the, my van wagon, which I was driving all alone. Now, all of you are doing very well. And I pray to God that you all have a long life and a long practicing life as well. Thank you. And, and uh, let me thank everyone uh, for a wonderful evening and the Kolkata Association of Ophthalmology for giving me time to, um, sh to share the views of everyone, fantastic videos and a great learning experience. And thank you so much. And thank you, Partha. Thank you, very sir. Much. Thank you sir. It was indeed an uh, honor to be a part of this uh, scientific fiesta today evening. And as beautifully as Dr. Bakhi sir has summed up and all of you, I've summed up that this is this was a real learning experience for all of us sharing and uh, witnessing some of the beautiful presentations, discussions, and uh, lots to learn. So thank you, each one of you, our chairperson, our panelists, our speakers, uh, Greval sir, especially. Thank you so much for staying up with us uh, till now and our discussions and of course the very able moderators who took our ship so nicely sailing through. Thank you very much. I wish safety for all of you here and I hand over to our secretary of KO, Dr. Shurajit Chakraborty, to finally say our goodbye. Bye.
Thank you, Dr. Subhuta. Uh, so it is a really nice uh, learning experience uh, for all of us uh, to see such a galactic, uh, galaxy of uh, presenters. And uh, we really enjoyed your talk. We really learned from you. And a uh, small announcement, uh, we have our next program on 8th of October. That's uh, coming up with the uh, uh, small evening webinar on glaucoma. So hope you enjoyed all this program today. So, uh, and a big thanks to the sponsor of this event, uh, Zais India. Uh, thanks to them also. Thanks to all of you and hope we hoping to uh, see you in our uh, future webinars as well. So a big thanks to all of you. Uh, see you. Bye. 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 Bye.